everyone. We wanted to begin this morning with a, a word of prayer, and evidently for those who are still on their way, that they get here safely in the blizzard, freezing cold of Sarasota, Florida. But uh, I want to welcome you and let you know that the uh, cell phones need to be turned down or put them on vibrate as, if you can, and let you know that children will remain in the morning service. Our missionary for this week is Randy and Linda Perkins, our missionary, long-term missionaries to Australia. And when you think about missionaries, sometimes they take on a, a different kind of persona of unique people who don't have life's problems, but the Perkins have certainly been through a, a, num a number of physical challenges, health issues to the ministry, very effective servants to the Lord out in Australia. Please keep them in prayer today. Then I'd like to ask for some to come forward to pray uh, in a minute for three special prayer requests. Uh, one is for Rosa Garde. She's the Spanish teacher for TCA. And she was having some uh, chest pain and went to the hospital for fluid in her lung. And when they drained the fluid and did the test, turns out she has breast cancer and it's gone to her lungs. And it's in a very severe state. She won't be able to finish teaching the rest of the year. She's a very popular and effective teacher here at school. So if you'd pray for Rosa Garde and those who would come forward to do that uh, in a minute. And then Leslie Hale, he's a, a television preacher. He's a friend of mine. He's on Saturday nights at 9 o'clock. He wears a baseball cap. He's the one who has the um, tabernacle in the wilderness up in Newport, Richie. It's an exact replica of it. Just a fantastic uh, minister. About once a month or so, he gives me a call to encourage me about how much he's been blessed by the Bible teaching uh, from the TV show that I do with my father-in-law. A dear friend, but he is at death's door, and he just seems to be able to be healthy enough to preach on Sunday and then tape his programs on Thursday, and then he's out again for the rest of the week. That's been going on for months. But I told him we'd pray for him this morning. Leslie Hale is his name. And then for Nolan and Amanda Towner, uh, we want to continue our, our ministry of reconciliation and uh, comfort to them. And tomorrow, they enter the next phase of the restoration process of uh, making everything right with what happened here a little over a year and a half ago. But uh, I want you to pray for Nolan and Amanda. Nolan will be going in uh, to Sarasota County Jail tomorrow for 45 days. And then the, after that, under house arrest for a while. It's a very difficult transition for anybody, much less for a, a young couple. But they are church members, and they've done everything they can to, to uh, uh, make right what went wrong. And, and we forgave them. They asked for forgiveness. And we're standing by them. They're here every Sunday. They're over here this morning. I'm going to ask them to come find a place to kneel here. And then if some of you would kneel next to them, some of you find a place to pray for Leslie Hale, and some of you find a place to pray for Rosa Garde. Let's all stand together, and you come where you feel led to pray. And Amanda Nolan, if you don't mind coming down here in the front. And for those who are gathered with Nolan and Amanda, just pray that God will give them peace and strength to get through this next difficult, difficult phase. For those who want to pray for Leslie Hale, that God will allow him to preach well this morning. He's a faithful servant with some of the most amazing stories of God's provision you'll ever hear. He's uh, dedicated to teaching the Word of God non-manipulatively, without an agenda. And then those who would pray for Rosa Garde, a uh, single woman with uh, breast and lung cancer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we know there are, there are people with great challenges and great burdens on their heart and minds, and many are, are seated right here in our auditorium. Things that they're facing this week, uh, uh, Penny Richards, who has uh, been in the hospital all week and has been struggling with um, her reoccurring health issues and how you've sustained her has just been miraculous. We pray you'll comfort her. For B. Burton and Ruth Bailey, who have had uh, similar type physical challenges this week. But we also pray for Rosa Garde, that you'll touch her body, that you'll give the doctors and the nurses wisdom, that the chemotherapy therapy that she's already begun will have the effect intended. But she professes faith in you and is a believer, and I pray you'll give her comfort that only your spirit can. 
And then, Father, we also pray for Leslie Hale, uh, this faithful minister of the gospel who's been preaching the truth for more than 60 years and on two different continents and has been used by you in so many ways. May you give him the strength he needs today to get in that pulpit one more time and preach again. May you bless his message and touch his body and heal him. And then, Father, we pray for Amanda and Nolan as they go into this next phase of the process of, of a full restoration and restitution and dealing with the issues from a year and a half ago. Maybe you'll give uh, Nolan a sense of your presence, comfort his heart for Amanda. You'll do the same for her. She'll be uh, by herself. May we remember them both in prayer throughout the 45 days. And then, Father, we pray for our president and vice president and members of Congress, the things they say, the things they do, the things they tweet, that you will somehow bring that all under your umbrella of sovereignty so that your will gets done in our country. That you'll bring godly people to bring counsel to them. And may the church be more focused on being true salt and light than being political activists or church growth experts. May we be what you want us to be in our rotting and uh, dying culture. We pray for the men and women stationed around the world and the United States Armed Forces that you'll keep them safe and bless their families. For those in the Sarasota uh, law enforcement, uh, fire department, and rescue, that you'll bless them, keep them safe as well, and bless their families. And if each one of us today may this hour together edify and encourage and free us up uh, to live by the words of Christ this week. For we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now before we turn around to shake each other's hands, we want to sing happy birthday to Elton Smith. He's walking down the aisle right there. His birthday is Tuesday. Let's sing happy birthday to him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Elton. Happy birthday to you. Amen. All right. Turn around and shake hands with those around you. Make sure everybody feels welcome. In just a moment, we'll begin. to our time of worship this morning and we've did, we did this song a couple weeks ago for most of you it might be a new song um, you are good and uh, Emily's going to help out with clapping get you guys clapping this morning uh, but let's sing this together You are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Let's sing that again. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. We worship you.
prepare for this morning's offering. Don't, don't be seated just yet. I just want to see something. I want to just prove to myself that we are capable of doing this. Let's see if we can clap together. Look at that. What an amazing thing to see. Okay, I just wanted to prove. I was over there and I thought, are we handicapped? Is there some reason why this poor lady up here is doing this? I'm hearing no sounds. But... We'll do a little tutorial next week. We'll have a little tutorial. All right, ushers, please come forward and let's pray for this morning's offering. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege we have to give and for the abundant blessings of living where we live and how you have provided for us in this wonderful country. And we don't want to take it for granted or hoard our treasures or pile up our treasures here on earth. We want to lay up treasures in heaven. And may today's expression of faith and worship in the offering be sincere, genuine, cheerful, purposeful, and then may you bless it and bless each one who gives. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace. Comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for 
for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while you hear each spoken need, yet love us way too much to give us lesser things. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights or what it takes to know your need? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in the sky? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness, we doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know your need? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, stand. We're going to continue in worship. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. My chains are gone. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found 
was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me Like a flood His mercy reigns An ending love
What a wonderful reminder in music today of the, the reason why we're here, the purpose we've came to achieve today and what draws us all together from different backgrounds, maybe even different philosophical view, viewpoints, 
hopefully different political viewpoints, uh, different eth uh, ethnic backgrounds, that we've all united around one thing, the power of the cross. On December 31st, I preached a message in which I revealed to you what I am passionate about as a pastor, and I admitted that I am not passionate about church growth when it comes to attendance, but I am passionate about everyone who attends our church growing in the knowledge and the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because if we do that, everything else falls into place uh, correctly. Many people have said that Jesus was a revolutionary, <clears throat> he was a reformer, that he's a restorer, and all those are true. He came to right the ship. But when you realize what he focused on and what he began with, when he came here to accomplish his mission, where did he start? Well, he didn't talk about synagogue growth principles. He didn't talk about temple outreach programs. He didn't talk about greater visibility in the community or whatever the social media of the day that was having a better presence on it. He talked about the heart of the individual believer. And that brings us to our message today, which is going to be the Sermon on the Mount. We're only going to look at a couple of verses in Matthew chapter 5. He focused on the heart of the believer because if that gets right, the life gets right. And the, and the advice is incredibly simple. Eight verses has spawned thousands of books and thousands of sermons. This is the wisdom of simplicity. When I was in eighth grade, in the middle of my football season, I separated my shoulder. And it was, the, at that time, the worst injury I'd ever had. My arm just sort of hung to the left, and I had to put it in a sling, and I was going to miss the rest of the season and I had made the all-star team, and I was really disappointed. And I'm sitting in the living room. We were brand new Christians. We just got saved about maybe five weeks earlier. My dad is sitting across me in the living room, and one of his favorite statements to me was, I've had bigger sores than that in my eyeball whenever I complained about an injury. But he's being unusually comforting to me. And uh, he said, Dave, does, does it hurt to, to lift your arm? And I said, yeah, it does. He goes, well, he goes, do this real slow. And he brought his hand up real slow like that and went like this. And, I, and so I did that. He goes, now bring your other one up. And this is the one that the shoulder was separated. I got it up real slow. And I got them both up. He said, now move your hands. And I went uh, like that. He goes, and he waved back at me. <laughs> and then I, that got me laughing. And the laughing made it hurt worse. And I was holding my arm like that. He goes, Dave, did that hurt? And I said, yes. He goes, well, then don't do it. Well, it was the simplicity of that wisdom the same kind of thing applies here to what Christ is going to speak so succinctly and so briefly and so pointedly, the depth gets missed by many people. The Sermon on the Mount, many consider the greatest sermon ever preached. It's not primarily political. It's not societal. It's not even necessarily theological. It is personal. It expounds on the writings of Moses, David, and the prophets, but it is not a doctrinal treatise. It is a practical manual as to how to live. And it's so powerful, at the end of the sermon, the Bible says, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribe. As a matter of fact, the message was so powerful, the mountain he preached on didn't have a name until this point. And after this, it was forever called the Mount of the Beatitudes. This powerful sermon wasn't supplanting the Old Testament. It wasn't a phase before the New Testament. This was a revelation of the guidelines of what God expects from his people in all eras and in all times. If you're going to live in God's kingdom, this is the way you are supposed to live. And that's really what the church is about. So we've, as we start 2018, we want to grow in the grace and the love and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That begins in our hearts. Um, there are many other reasons people go to church, and none of them are necessarily bad, but they're not the primary reason. If you're coming to get life enhancement principles, you know, go to a, a Tony Robbins seminar. Go to hear Zig Ziglar or John Maxwell. They're all great. They all say really good stuff. Or stay home and watch Oprah Winfrey. She says some good stuff that can enhance your life. It's all good, but that's not what church is about. 
Church is about hearing from the Word of God in such a way that it changes you on the inside and makes you more like Christ um, instead of just more fulfilled and more happy. In Matthew chapter 4, 23 through 25, introducing these, the Bible says, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So this message, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, is the gospel of the kingdom and often gets um, associated with the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, two terms that actually are um, often interchanged and used in the same verse. But some people think the kingdom of heaven might mean the uh, establishment of God's Christ's reign on earth and the kingdom of God is Christ's reign in your heart. But that distinction sort of gets lost when they're used interchangeably. It means both of those things. The gospel of, of the kingdom is the complete lordship of Jesus Christ in your hearts and over this world that will be realized at some point in time in the future. So that's what he's coming to do. So we have chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to look at uh, four verses. Seeing the multitudes, that's how it begins, uh, the audience was not just the twelve. And it was not just his inner core of people. It was all those who came to hear. Some came to be blessed. Some came to learn. Some came to critique. This message was for all of them. And listen to the people who were there. The multitudes was comprised of scribes who were the legalists of the day. They were the lawyers and the interpreters of the law. It was comprised of traditionalists. Those were the Pharisees who believed in a strict observance of rabbinic laws and traditions and teachings. Then you had the modernists, the Sadducees were there. They're the ones who discounted the supernatural, and they wanted everything to be practical and material. You had separatists who were there. They, they were the Essenes, who thought real spirituality was removing yourselves from society. And then you had the activists, the zealots, who were the nationalists. They believed that true religion demanded political and military activism. That's the multitude. Christ is preaching to all of them. And if there's one thing the church should be, it should be a place where everybody is welcome to come and hear the truth of God, regardless of their viewpoints. Whether or not you are a legalist, a traditionalist, a modernist, a separatist, or an activist, a liberal, or a conservative, or a libertarian, or a republican, or a democrat, or independent, you're a citizen or you're not a citizen, all those distinctions should be just obliterated by the cross and the teaching of God's Word. The church should be the place where everyone gathers to hear truth. Imagine if that would have been the case prior to the uh, war between the states, the Civil War. Could we not have come up with a better solution to slavery than having the bloodiest war in our history, killing each other? If the church had been the church... If its purpose had been preaching and teaching the Word of God and living out the principles that Christ is going to bring up here. So the focus of true religion is not ritualism, it's not separatism, it's not traditionalism or activism, but it's having a right relationship with God that fosters right relationships with people. That's the whole essence of what true religion is really about, getting right with God and that rightness with God makes you want to interact with others in a right way. So Christ then was seated uh, because that was the position of a rabbi when he taught authoritatively. His disciples came to him in the midst of this thing because they knew this was going to be important because he sat down to talk. And then this phrase, he opened his mouth and taught them saying. Opened his mouth, taught them saying. It's a, it's a redundancy, saying it three times. That was an idiom of the day that meant this was an official, authoritative, impacting, important thing he was about to say. And what follows is what we call the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes have often been misunderstood. Uh, they are perspectives, virtues, and attitudes that true believers walking in spiritual peace and joy will have and demonstrate. The eight descriptions listed are not eight different kinds of believers. It's not eight different types of people. It's eight traits of a truly joyful believer, a citizen of the kingdom at that time and a citizen of the kingdom when Christ comes back. 
And there's a progressive nature to them. There, there's an order of development. Each one gives rise to the next. They're building blocks. They're not steps. They're not steps you climb up and leave the other one behind as you ascend. They are building blocks to a life of faith. As you add one, you continue to build and incorporate all of them to become a full, mature believer. So when you read just the first few verses of Matthew 5 and you read the Beatitudes, you can focus on that probably for the rest of your life, trying to incorporate that and add that and have it buffer your attitudes and your words and your actions, and it would make you a better, um, more faithful follower of Christ. This is what he said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now this is incredibly radical. To the people who heard it, this makes no sense whatsoever. It completely turns everything upside down. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. It would be the same thing if somebody said to me, David, happy are you if your team loses in the college playoff with a 17-point lead in double overtime. Happy are you. It wouldn't make any sense. That's the way these people heard it. What is he saying? Happy are you if you're poor in spirit. Being poor is the, was one of the worst plagues of the day. And being mourning, how does mourning go along with being blessed? Well, Christ uses the word makarioi in Greek for blessed. And that's to describe members of his kingdom. Uh, makarioi means literally to make long or lengthy. But in the context of contentment, it means to have lasting happiness, contentment, and peace. So he says, lasting happiness, contentment, and peace belongs to the poor in spirit, and those who mourn. Lasting contentment, happiness, and peace. That's everybody's goal. Everybody here wants that. Some of you have given up on it. Some of you believe it will never happen, but we all want it. So we seek whatever we think will provide it for us. So as humans, we seek money. We seek fame, success, power, uh, revenge, pleasure, sex, love, food, self-realization, self-expression, making a contribution, leaving a legacy, having children. Some people even seek happiness by giving up. They seek it through cynicism, through skepticism, pessimism, disbelief, even rebellion. Rarely do we think that submission and obedience is, is the best route to happiness. The psalmist said, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord is God. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. And Solomon wrote, whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. So the question would be, are you happy? On Thursday, I taped some programs with uh, Herman for our program, uh, Dr. David Herman, and the question was, why aren't believers more happy? And that assumes we're even happy at all. But the question was, why aren't we more happy? We really should just be bouncing off the walls with, we've been freed, but something keeps us from doing that. What is it? Well, the, the most succinct answer to the question is the Beatitudes. We're not following them. Because Jesus just tells us eight times, happy you will be if you do this, or if you are this. Happy you will be if you are this. So if, if we're not happy, the logic follows that we're not these things. But there's some other practical things involved too. But Christ connected lasting happiness, contentment, and peace with two conditions that we don't associate with happiness, and that is being poor and mourning. And not only do, do we not associate them with happiness, we see them as being the exact opposites. So we have to ask ourselves, what does he mean by being poor in spirit and being in mourning? Well, being poor in spirit and mourning are developments towards true, full, spiritual maturity. 
They're like ingredients in a really good recipe. They're mixed together to produce a delicious flavor and a sweet-smelling aroma up to God. The true biblical faith demonstrated by a member of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or who practices the gospel of the kingdom begins with these two ingredients. And then it adds six more. Poor in spirit is one word, tokos in, Greece, in Greek, and it means one who shrinks, one who cowers, or one who cringes, and it was the label for a beggar. So you can see why they, they didn't know what he was talking about. Happy is the beggar in spirit. The word mourning is penthuntes, and it's actually, it's a present participle, so it has an I-N-G on it. It means those who are mourning, or the mourning ones. It's a continual action. Of the nine Greek words for mourning, this is the strongest, the most severe, and the most, the most heartfelt. It's about a deep agony associated with the death of a loved one. So Christ has taken two vivid words, tokos and penthuntes, and he's told his hearers, makarioi, lasting contentment and happiness is yours if you're tokos and penthuntes. It just, it was mind-blowing. They didn't understand what he was talking about. So I wonder if we, do we have that same question today? In what should we be poor and, in, and for what should we be mourning? Many people think that the poorness is to be in money, so they take vows of poverty, or everything they make, they give away. But the important phrase there is poor in spirit, and that indicates a genuine awareness and recognition of something, uh, and it tells you where the poverty is to be rooted, not in your bank account, but in your spirit. So the poverty is not material and it's not possessions, but it's a poverty of pride, a poverty of self-sufficiency, a poverty of self-reliance or self-righteousness. It means those things are absent from you. The poverty is in your poor in spirit. You have nothing to say, I am special, look at me. But it's your awareness of that. True biblical faith begins with the inescapable awareness that you have no inherent spiritual value. That's the beginning point because that is what makes you turn to see who can provide that for you. That is the danger of preaching a gospel that does not mention this. Because without the law, there's no need for man to uh, be convicted of sin. Without an awareness that I'm, I'm bereft of any value, you don't go to the one who has all the riches of heaven. The tax collector who wouldn't even look up to heaven and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said he went away justified. Moses was called the meekest man on the earth. Saul, before he strayed from God, he was made great when he was little in his own eyes. The Gentile woman who asked for Jesus to bless and said that she'd be satisfied with crumbs from the table of the Jews. Then the thief on the cross who looked at the other thief and said, we deserve death, but this man has done nothing. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's poor in spirit, realizing I'm bringing nothing to the table. Now, this is very difficult for our generation, particularly maybe more than anyone in history. Because our generation treasures self-affirmation, self-promotion, and self-congratulation, which is why universalism is on the rise in the church of Jesus Christ. Universalism is that everybody goes to heaven. It's, it's the expression of modern America. Everybody gets a ribbon. Everybody gets a trophy. Nobody loses. We all win. That, that's so American, and it's so generational, and it's crept into the church that there's no need for repentance, brokenness, change. Really no need to even believe in Christ because you get to go to heaven anyway. That's why this one issue of being poor in spirit is so important. Psalm 51.17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God. These you will not despise. 
So poor in spirit is basically spiritual humility. And it's presented first in the Beatitudes because it sets the tone and establishes the foundation and it plants the seed for the growth and development and the building of kingdom living. Kingdom living is not what is being talked about on Christian television and in Christian bookstores today. Kingdom living is not somehow accruing all the wealth of the world and getting a monetary transfer of the world's wealth to you. That's not kingdom living. Kingdom living is the Beatitudes. We've, we've twisted it. Then the word is mourning. This is not mourning or grief due to some carnal desire or the natural headaches of life. And it's not mourning because you're unable to accept God's comfort because you like the pain or for some reason. And it's not sadness due to the related consequences of your actions that can't be changed. It's not despair. It's not depression. It's not pessimism. It's not cynicism. It's not skepticism. He's not saying happy are you if you're absolutely miserable and you don't believe in anything and you have no hope. That's not the mourning he's talking about. There are some proper mournings in the Bible. Reasonable grief over the death of a loved one. Sorrow over the hardships somebody else is facing. Sorrow over your own personal suffering. But the one implied in, Be in the Beatitudes is a deep sorrow over the shortcomings of your own moral standing with God. So you can see how the two go together. It's, I'm poor in spirit. I have nothing to bring to God. And then the mourning sets in. I regret and I'm sorrowful that I'm bereft of any moral virtue. The poor in spirit leads to the heartfelt mourning. So this morning is a humble, heartfelt repentance, fully hoping in restoration. It is a hopeful sorrow that through this sorrow I will be made whole. So those who realize their spiritual poverty and those who are mourning their sin in true biblical repentance will be comforted, he promises. And part of it is because they possess the kingdom of heaven. In other words, they already possess more than all the pleasures of life, all the treasures of life. They already possess more than they deserve to an infinite degree they already possess more than they can even imagine. It's just not here. But we possess it. It's waiting for us. So he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Is both a promise and an edifying contrast. <laughs> They're poor in spirit, but they possess the kingdom of heaven. Their spirit has no pride, no self-sufficiency, no self-righteousness. But they possess the riches and the glory that only Christ Jesus can give. And they're made joint heirs with Christ. From the lowest to the highest. This is the only beatitude, by the way, with a present blessing. The other ones are all promised. They shall be, they shall have. This one says they've got it. If you're poor in spirit, yours, you own, you're possessed by, you belong in the kingdom of heaven. Isaiah 57, 15, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. That doesn't mean that Christians walk around just miserable and crying all the time. It means in our spirit, we are broken before God and, and prideless before God and sorrow, sorrowful over our failures. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. Psalm 138, 6, though the Lord is on high, Yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Matthew 6, later on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, 
where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break and steal. That's the kingdom of heaven. He said in John chapter 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that there where I am you may be also. What an amazing promise to everyone in this room. If you're poor in spirit and mourning over your sin, he said, yours is the kingdom of heaven and you will be comforted. And Jesus said, if I leave this earth, I'm going to go to my father's house and make a place for you. And I'm going to come back and get you. That should just make the frown turn into a smile. It should make the hunched over shoulders lift up that, that we're the winners in all this because somebody paid the price. Romans 8, 16, and 17 says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Yesterday I was looking at the news, and I saw some 20-year-old kid in Florida won the mega millions, 400 and something million dollars. I thought... That'd be nice. I'd like to have that happen to me. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Evidently, God can't trust me with that kind of money, so it's not going to happen. But wouldn't that be a neat thing to happen? That's, that's pauper money <laughs> compared to what we actually do have. We have all of heaven. Much better than the mega millions or the other ones that you... That, that's just pocket change. You know, we have it if we're poor in spirit and we're mourning. Then he says, they shall be comforted. Paraklethesantai. And it's a, where we get the word paraclete or a comforter. Jesus, the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Poor in spirit, mourning over sin. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world, those other sorrows we mentioned, they produce death. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. The only true and lasting comfort is complete and full restoration. And that's the message of the gospel. And it begins with poor in spirit and in mourning. So Paul writes in Thessalonians, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Comfort. The church is a place where comfort should be abundant. James 4, 8 through 10, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. This is the Lord's brother. James is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Another son of Mary. He's writing this because his ministry was, was right after the life of Christ, where he becomes a believer. He becomes the pastor of the church of Jerusalem, and James is one of the first books written before the Gospels. So the book of James reflects the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> He's saying, lament and mourn. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. James is not saying walk around with a sour puss on your face. He says, break before God. Be sorrowful. Be broken. Be humble. And he will lift you up with a joy that will be unspeakable. So being poor in spirit and mourning over your sin, it does some things for you. It releases you from the idea that God owes you anything, because he doesn't. It positions you to ask from God and receive, because he responds to that poor in spirit and mourning, the broken and the contrite heart. It helps you bear your affliction, whatever it might be. It nourishes your love for other people, 
like in this room right now, everyone here, what we all deserve and what we're all going to get are two <laughs> vastly different things. Every person seated next to you is a sinner who did things worthy of God's judgment. But every person who's a believer in Christ has been baptized in the body of Christ, had their sins removed, taken away, had the righteousness of Christ imputed in them, and they're just like you. They're going to heaven, although they don't have any idea how they got on the train. You look around and think, we're all going the same place. Regardless of skin color, regardless of political view, regardless of nationality, it makes you love other people. Number five, it strengthens you against temptation because it makes you realize what you're sorrowful over and what you've been mourning you don't want to do again. So it strengthens you. It releases you from the tyranny of self. If you're not poor in spirit, you begin to believe you, it's up to you. And you can do it. And when you, leave, when you, when you lose the belief that you can do it, then you are hopeless if you believe it's up to you. It leads you to worship Jesus when you realize all he's done for you. Isn't he worth a song or two? Isn't he worth some time in church? Isn't he worth a moment in prayer when you realize what he has done for you and what you didn't deserve at all? And then eight, it prepares you to add the next ingredients. We're going to do two each Sunday, so in three more weeks we'll be finished with the eight. Being poor in spirit and in mourning over your sin prepares you to add the next ones. Until you add these to your life and you begin to reflect the very fruit of the Spirit and, and you walk, as, as Peter said, having not forgotten that you were forgiven of your sins. So are you poor in spirit? And are you mourning over your sin? Jesus said, if you are, you are blessed. You're a makarioi. Lasting contentment, peace, and happiness begins with these initial steps. Not just to get saved, but the way you live your life from then on. If the churches of Jesus Christ in America alone, if we decided to focus on that, instead of just filling up our churches with people and having great programs and exciting this and wonderful that and doing all the... If we just started focusing on, are we as an individual living by the Beatitudes? If churches were full of people living by the Beatitudes, the worship would be through the roof. <laughs> if people were living by the Beatitudes, service would just be happening everywhere. You'd be serving people. If we were living by the Beatitudes, we would be salt and light to our decaying culture. And it would be, it would be so... Um, inclusive. It would affect everybody and everything. You know, there was a time in the revivalistic days of the Reformation when the church affected the arts. It affected education. The church affected everything because it just poured out of people. They wanted to live what God made them to be. Uh, the best way to have a revolution, the best way to have reformation, the best way to restore things and the church of Jesus Christ in 2018 is to begin with you and me and our hearts. Are we living by the, the Beatitudes? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for these amazing words of Christ and just these two verses today. Blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who mourn. We find ourselves exposed before you as prideful people pursuing other opportunities or other venues of happiness rather than letting the joy of our life come from our faith in you, from the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of your word. We thank you for all the other things you add to our life to enhance our joy and, and to enhance our happiness, family and love and, and food and shelter and comfort, pleasures, laughter. Father, we thank you for all those things, but Prevent us from letting that be the foundation of our joy. May we have lasting contentment, happiness, and peace because before you, we have no pride. Before you, we have no self-righteousness, no self-sufficiencies, and we are sorrowful for our failures. Help us have that attitude every day so we can receive from you the good gifts you have for us with grace and humility and open hands. 
Let me ask you to keep your heads bowed just for a moment to ask God what he may have had for you in this message. If there was something particular for you, ask yourself, God, is there a reason you had Pastor Dave preach that and have me here at the same time? Was this for me? Father, may we respond to your spirit. May we respond to the convicting truth of your word, the simple profundity of Christ. As he said things that almost made no sense to the people, but were so rooted and saturated with truth that they're undeniable. May you draw us back to that. Then, Father, help us live out that faith in a way that pleases you, that impacts our community, impacts our nation, but more importantly, impacts our families and makes a difference in our own church here. May we be what you want us to be, for we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. I hope that message was a, a challenge to you and an inspiration to you. It was for me as, uh, as God laid it on my heart as I did the study myself. I try to preach things that say something to me, and I hope it, uh, it blesses you. And as you leave today, you'll be thinking about that during the week. What are those two Beatitudes? What are they to me, and how should I apply them? A few brief announcements. First of all, I want to announce the arrival of Audrey Ditchfield. Michael and Taylor had a little baby girl. There she is on the screen, already singing, as you can see.